This week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX is sponsored by GameSir. There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perf 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 deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the Lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Happy Spooky Day, ladies and gentlemen. For a card game whose one of three main components are these things called monster cards, it's probably no surprise that several of them are actual monsters, at least in our traditional understanding. The creepy crawlies, the nightmarish, and the most downright disturbing imagery of living creatures. The anime was no stranger to this concept, with characters that gave some of us growing up the, uh... The heebie-jeebies. On this scariest of days, we'll be looking at two characters from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX whose appearance would suggest that they celebrate Halloween year-round, Alice and Camula, with their terrifying anime-exclusive cards. The nightmare begins with Alice and her doll deck. Marionette Burial is a normal spell card that can only be activated while you control a face-up Alice the Wandering Doll. Send one face-up doll part blue, doll part red, doll part gold, and doll part pink you control to the graveyard. Special summon one doll chimera from your deck. Controlling five specific monsters to put one on the field, even from the deck, sounds like an absolutely terrible idea. Even if this were the most consistent deck imaginable, I'd be hard pressed to believe that a neg four would be worth it. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt and see what we're working with. Normal monsters! Sorry if that was too scary for you, but all of these doll part cards are level 1 dark spellcaster normal monsters with zero attack and defense, and each part color represents a broken piece of the doll chimera. The only way that this could get worse is if Alice is also a normal monster, thankfully she is not. Alice the Wandering Doll is a level 3 dark spellcaster effect monster with 300 attack and 1000 defense, and this card cannot be destroyed by battle. When this card is selected as an attack target, inflict 500 damage to your opponent, then switch control of this card at the end of the damage step. Kind of defeats the purpose of needing a card on your side of the field if that same card is bouncing all over the place. Immunity to battle destruction is at least serviceable, but we need a lot more than that. There's also zero mention of the doll part, so if you think that I'm about to last 5 turns playing one monster at a time, 80% of which are vanillas, you are sadly mistaken. Surely there is something that brings out these parts more efficiently, because even during the GX era, this was slower than death. Cursed Dollhouse is a field spell card that has a continuous effect while face up on the field, that when your opponent takes control of an Alice the Wandering Doll you control, you can special summon one doll part monster from your deck. Okay, we're speeding things up a bit here, but let's not celebrate too early. We're only gently tapping the gas with this card. Based on Alice's effect, Cursed Dollhouse would only be live once every other turn because the effect doesn't activate when the Wandering Doll jumps back to your field. That is, unless you control multiple copies of Alice. The effects of both Alice and Cursed Dollhouse are non once per turn, so in theory you have the ability to turbo out multiple doll part monsters. However, as good as that may sound, controlling multiple copies of Alice severely hinders your ability to accumulate the four necessary doll parts to activate Marionette Burial. On top of the fact that you'll reach a point where you can't get back your copies of Alice to your field because your field is now flooded with doll parts. I can see what they're going for here. I could see it upon reading the first card, however the execution is lacking. We still need something faster. These doll parts are already broken, so we need to stop worrying about chucking a bunch of them on the field. Necro Dollmeister is a normal trap card that can only be activated when a doll part monster you control is destroyed by battle. You have my attention, because that will inevitably happen while controlling a field full of low-level weak vanillas. Special summon two doll part monsters from your deck in face-up attack position. Now we're getting somewhere. I like this one, and it fits perfectly with the goal of the deck. Since it doesn't specifically require the doll monster to have been attacked, you also get the versatility of using it on your own turn, crashing a doll part monster to get two more more, putting you that much closer to using Burial. This one is good and should be run at no less than three copies. So, we have a viable option that might entice someone to run this Alice Doll deck, but we've yet to talk about Doll Chimera. What does this ancestor of the gimmick puppet archetype do? Doll Chimera is a level 5 dark spellcaster effect monster with zero attack and defense. It's a Nami monster that cannot be special summoned except by its own effect, or with Marionette Burial. This card gains 400 attack for each doll part monster in your graveyard. 
entering the field with 1600 attack points after all that effort is not giving me a good vibe. When this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can send two doll part monsters from your deck to the graveyard to special summon it. That's it? That's what you give me. A Nake 4 for a Garnet monster that comes to the field with the stats of a shitty level 4 monster and can recover itself to just barely become an okay level 5 monster. Pinch me because I must be dreaming that this is as awful as it seems. If you manage to have three copies of all four doll part monsters in your graveyard when this dollar store Halloween decoration hits the field, this card's attack would reach 4800. Is that good? Yes, of course it is. How likely is that exact situation though? There is a better chance of any horror movie in 2024 actually being good. It's not even a good possibility that you'd have two of each in the graveyard, which would still be a respectable 3200. When this plan ultimately fails, which it will, Alice's doll deck has a plan B that funny enough works best when the doll chimera play doesn't work out. The new nightmare starts with doll hammer, a normal spell card, and when activated you target one monster you control. Destroy it, then draw two cards, and change the battle position of one monster your opponent controls. How ironic that the card completely unrelated to this deck is by far the best. It's advantage neutral, which some players don't like. Look, not everything can be a straight plus, but pop a card to draw two is fantastic. And considering that most monsters you'd pop have a floating effect, you're probably still going plus one off this card. Really good stuff. But what does this have to do with Alice the Wandering Doll? I mean, the card artwork features Doll of Demise, so it seems like we're looking at the wrong character. Released Curse is a normal trap card which can only be activated when an Alice the Wandering Doll is destroyed. Destroy all cards on the field and inflict 300 damage to their owners for each card destroyed. Play Alice, pop with Doll Hammer, chain Curse. Blow up the entire field, burn, burn, burn. It's like an old scary movie, it's so good. What more could you ask for? Well, what if we get a free monster on top of that? Dream to Mirrorland is a normal spell card that can only be activated if Alice the Wandering Doll is in your graveyard. Special summon one Ishila the Lovely Bisque Doll from your hand or deck. So we aren't necessarily required to destroy Alice with Doll Hammer, but because Alice is immune to battle destruction, one of its only redeeming qualities, we are required to use effect destruction. Or I guess we could also mill it with Foolish Burial, which is the burial you should be playing in this deck, but Doll Hammer fits the bill, which gives us access to Mirrorland and this new monster. Ishila the Lovely Bisque Doll is a level 2 light spellcaster effect monster with 1000 attack and 300 defense. This card gains 1000 attack for every 4 doll part monsters in your graveyard with different names. Remember what I said about this plan B? Forget it. Forget this entire deck, except for Doll Hammer. This is just a worse version of Doll Chimera, and the wording on that attack boost effect is just strange. Does that mean it only gains a flat 1000 attack regardless of how many doll parts are in the graveyard? Or can it gain up to 3000 attack, which would require having all 12 individual doll part cards? Which is still just as unlikely as with the case of Doll Chimera. It's unfortunate because the playstyle of the deck is pretty interesting. We don't have any archetypal decks that play with multiple normal monsters. No, Law of the Normal doesn't count because those specific vanilla monsters were roped together out of nowhere and encompass several different small archetypes, but in and of themselves are not an actual archetype. I like the aesthetic of the deck far more than gimmick puppets, but an archetype given any and all attention to its appearance will always fail. There's no way around that. What we can get around to are the classics of the horror genre. Zombies, vampires, werewolves, and the like. Staples of the monster community and the deck choice of Camula. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. I like to play games. Do you like to play games? I want you to have a better gaming experience with the G7 HE controller for Xbox from GameServe, today's video sponsor. Sleek, compact, and comfortable design with mappable back buttons. It even comes with one month of Game Pass Ultimate with your purchase. You can purchase your own G7 HE controller for Xbox in the link of the description of this video. You can purchase your own G7 HE controller for Xbox in the link of the description of this video. Thank you, GameSir, for sponsoring this segment of today's video. 
Vampire Bat is a level 3 dark zombie effect monster with 800 attack and 1200 defense. That while face up on the field, that while face up on the field increases the attack of all face up zombie type monsters you control by 200 akin to Nightmare Penguin. Also on a non once per turn effect, if this face up card on the field would be destroyed, you can send one Vampire Bat from your deck to the graveyard instead. The shivers that have gone through my timbers is negligible. It's not about to become a staple card in any modern vampire deck. Truthfully, I would have preferred if it had an effect similar to their milling strategy, but for what it is, it's perfectly suited in a mid-GX era format. The immunity to destruction, albeit limited, may have played well in an early Monarch deck. Next is a 2 for 1 special in Zombie Werewolf, a level 4 dark zombie effect monster with 1200 attack and defense. And when this card is destroyed by battle, you can special summon a card with the same name from your deck and it gains 500 attack. Also pretty good for the format that it would have debuted in. It's right in line with the battle tutors of the era and would have made an excellent follow up to Mystic Tomato and or Pyramid Turtle, fitting the attribute and typing requirement for both. And the attack boosting when summoned by its own effect is a nice bonus. Anyone remember the monster Vampire Genesis? Unless you were a diehard fan for the vampire archetype, probably not. A classic boss monster featured in the original Zombie Madness structure deck. It wasn't very good, but maybe it was just missing the right support. Genesis Crisis is a continuous spell card that destroys itself and all face-up zombie type monsters you control if you do not control Vampire Genesis. On a soft once per turn, you can add one zombie type monster from your deck to your hand. That once per turn effect is phenomenal. The zombie monster type has pretty much always been a poster child for consistency and this card doesn't deviate from that, only improving it tenfold. But the requirement of controlling one of the worst zombie type monsters to ever haunt this game takes away any viable use this card would have undoubtedly had. So while Vampire Genesis definitely needs support to ever see any hope for modern play, this is not it. The best use for Vampire Genesis is to get it out of your hand as quickly as possible, not by summoning it though. Infernal Vania is a field spell card with the soft once per turn. During their main phase, the turn player can discard one zombie type monster to destroy all monsters on the field. The turn player cannot normal summon or set during the turn this effect is used. Unless you run into a mirror match, which without a tier 1 zombie strategy running is very unlikely, this works for you and you only. The mass destruction effect being a soft once per turn is kind of comical because there aren't many instances where you would need to use it more than once. That being said, zombies love being sent directly to the graveyard, so you won't see them complaining if the first attempt doesn't go through. The restriction from normal summoning is irrelevant to dedicated zombies, as the discarded rotting corpses have more than enough ways to special summon from grave, as well as the hand if you run the classic card Call of the Mummy. As good as zombies are as a generic monster type who basically all find synergy with one another, they aren't without some failed experimental types of cards. Seems that Camula took part in those creative liberties. Red Ghost Moon Moon is a normal trap card that can only be activated during your opponent's battle phase. Here we go folks, it's battle trap time. Camula has really impressed me so far, so what can she do with a battle trap? Discard one zombie type monster, gain life points equal to the attack of one attack position monster your opponent controls, then end the battle phase. I'm not going to say that it's a bad card, but at the same time it would be easier to just run negate attack. Let's be realistic here. It's negate attack with extra conditions that, if not met, make this set card dead on the field. The discard of a zombie is appreciated, don't get me wrong, but I want my battle traps to be live upon being set. The only things I should be worrying about is my opponent having an out to the battle trap and or them not attacking. I shouldn't be prepared for my own deck to fail. Another byproduct of what I consider Konami's several experimental phases with the design of card effects is the many cards that we have that only get their effect when destroyed while set on the field. No effects to activate when flipped face up, no hand trap like effects to give them at least something of value that isn't just praying your opponent is playing back row destruction. I dislike this category of cards immensely. Zombie Bed is a normal trap card and when this set card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, special summon one level 4 or lower zombie type monster from your deck. Sounds about right. And before any of you say that a card like this can be popped by your own back row destruction for a free summon, let's bring it back to reality. You've been watching too many horror movies because that is a horrible idea. An effect like this, and I will parrot this statement for every card with an effect like it, should be a secondary effect that you aren't relying on. Going into Camula's last card, the party of the undead is over. We're abandoning any and all logic in card design in PSET. It's a card that, as is, we will never see in the physical game unless made as a joke promotional piece, but I'd rather we kept this joke exclusive to the anime. Illusion Gate is a normal spell card that when activated, you must offer a soul to the sacred beast. 
Ah, rats, I just offered my last soul in the previous video, so I can't even activate this. Well, what does it do? Destroy all monsters that your opponent controls, then special summon one monster that your opponent has used during this duel, ignoring the summoning conditions. I mean, for a whole ass soul, I'm gonna need a bit more than Regeki and a slightly better Monster Reborn. If you lose the duel after activating this card, that soul will be owned by the Sacred Beast. As long as it's not my soul, I'm not gonna sweat this one. The effects aren't bad by any means, but the cost is far too heavy. Souls aren't exactly in steady supply, and Spirit Halloween only sells those stupid fake souls. But with the final card down, it's time to get into something that is truly terrifying. At least if you're still in school. Grades! It's time for the patent pending purple pineapple grading scale. Of the 20 cards covered in the scariest episode to date, Alice and Camula get a clean 40%, with only 8 cards that I think are worthy of a physical print. Seeing how poorly Alice performed with her anime exclusives, like many a slasher film, this one was predictable. Thank you.